Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where we may glean an abundance of information pertaining to the myriad events and developments occurring on the North Fork of Long Island. Here we endeavor to illuminate both the pressing issues and the myriad opportunities within our community, as well as to recount the narratives of individuals and events past and present that have shaped our locale. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and it is my pleasure to present episode 63 with our guest today, Emily de Marchelier, the proprietor of de Marchelier Bistro in Greenport. Emily illuminates her illustrious family history, beginning with her parents' decision to immigrate to the United States during her childhood and established a French restaurant in New York City in the late 1970s. The original de Marchelier, an undeniable triumph, served as a precursor to Emily's own remarkable journey. Our discussion traverses her formative years, during which she adeptly navigated life between the bustling metropolis of New York City and the serene environs of Shelter Island. We explore her post-collegiate endeavors which ultimately led her back to the family business where she contributed her own unique flair. In 2020, Emily inaugurated her own establishment in Greenport, encapsulating the quintessential French bistro ambiance and culinary excellence, thus enriching the North Fork's gastronomic landscape. Emily also tells her aspirations for the future of the region, so I hope you enjoy episode 63 with Emily de Marchelier. This episode was recorded June 3rd, 2024. Thank you so much for coming on to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me. And to start off, can you give me a, a brief introduction about yourself? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Emily de Marchelier. I, I live on Shelter Island and opened my business here in Greenport uh, almost four years ago uh, on Main Street, on the north side of Main Street. Family's been in the business uh, for over 40 years uh, in Manhattan. And before the pandemic, we closed our restaurant and I, uh, my parents retired and I decided to move the business here to Greenport and live on uh, Shelter Island permanently, so. Mm. And in terms of your ancestry going back on both of your parents' side, how far back can you go? Um, Well, my family is from France. Uh, I was born in Paris. My father's side is from Normandy, um, going back um, many generations. And my mom is from Versailles, um, also going back um, many generations as well. Mm. And was it your parents that immigrated over here? Yes. So um, I was born in Paris and my parents came to New York City uh, soon thereafter. And my father opened a restaurant on 62nd and Lexington Avenue, the first de Marchelier. Uh, I was there for 13 years. I also had a catering business uh, for a little while and opened and closed several other restaurants through 40 years in Manhattan, some in uh, South Carolina, and uh, but mm-hmm. mostly uh, in Manhattan. Wow. And did your parents say what their decision was in terms of coming over to New York? Um, I'm not really sure exactly. Um, I know that my uncle Patrick de Marchelier was a photographer. My father worked with him uh, doing that for some time. And he started working more in the United States for for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And I think in their travels to Manhattan, uh, fell in love with the city and saw a lot of opportunity there. And they decided to open up a restaurant, but were they in the restaurant business in France? As well? No, they weren't. Um, on my dad's side, there he did have an aunt uh, that was uh, had some nightclubs in in Normandy and Le Havre. But my parents had a thrift shop in Paris. Um, 
He did some photography for some time. He did a lot of things. Mm. Uh, my mom was an athlete. Uh, she was champion of France in swimming mm. uh, when she was young, uh, carried the Olympic torch when she was 16 through the streets oh. of Paris for a kilometer. And um, and then she was a airline attendant for TWA for some time. And mm. then she and my, my father met. And I think soon thereafter, they came over to the United States. Wow. <laughs> and did they say how the experience was for them opening up that restaurant initially in New York City? Um, well, it was a huge success. We had a, it was a very small restaurant and um, my uncle was his partner and they had, you know, in with all the modeling agencies and models. And so it was full with celebrities and, and very popular at the time. Studio 54 was nearby mm -hmm. and there were, you know, not that many rest French restaurants in New York City at that time in 78 when they opened. Mm -hmm. And then for you growing up, were you growing up in Manhattan at that time? Uh, yeah, so um, I went to school in Manhattan to a French school named Fleming. It was just up the street from the restaurant on 62nd and Madison. Um, the restaurant was on 62nd and Lex. And my parents found uh, Shelter Island through, I believe, through the chef um, that he had at, at De Marchelier. Uh, we started coming out here on the weekends, probably summer of 79, mm. and rented a house for about 18 years until they decided to buy a house okay. where we spent even more time. <laughs> yes. And how was it for you growing up in the, the city as a child? Well, it's all I really knew. So um, I was lucky enough that we had, you know, summers out here. So it was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, urban and, you know, country living balance. Mm. Uh, it was it was great. I mean, the city is all I know um, growing up. So I wouldn't know what it would be like to grow up in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> and what what are some memories you have early on? coming out here that you can remember any activities that you would do? Oh, yeah. Well, I learned to play golf uh, Gardner's Bay Country Club. I was sailing when I was eight years old at the at the Shelter Island Yacht Club, mm -hmm. riding my bike around Shelter Island with my friends, just having total freedom. I mean, I don't think that my parents saw me from <laughs> from, you know, from the morning till, you know, eight o'clock at night, at yeah. certainly until I got dark. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, say, the opposite in the city? What things would you do? Well, when I was in the city, it was all like academic. It was like going mm -hmm. to school and weekends. I would mostly go away with friends to their homes outside of the city. Mm -hmm. um, I only was in the city until I was about 13 years old because mm -hmm. I was um, went to boarding school after that in Connecticut. So really I lived in Connecticut for four years and I went to college so really that's why I always felt like Shelter Island was more home mm -hmm. um, than the city the city was fun uh, you know we did a lot of I don't know we went to museums and mm -hmm. uh, sports in the park and all that sort of thing yes but um, it was more school and work and coming out here for for play now, more so when you went to Connecticut, how was that environment for schooling and what were you gravitating towards in terms of subject matter or core classes that you were interested in? Um, well, I went to Choate Rosemary Hall. It's in Wallingford. And I always gravitated more towards art. Mm. Um, took a lot of art classes, mixed media, painting, uh, drawing, and I love sciences also. Mm -hmm. I love like, <laughs> these are the facts. <laughs> yes. Like there's yes or no. <laughs> yeah. That's, whereas a lot of uh, some of the other classes, it's like, oh, there's some more leeway in things. Yeah, but yeah. Kind of like, these are the answers. <laughs> Never did well in English and even languages. I tried to mm. do Spanish for a year just to learn a different language because I grew up speaking French. Mm. But 
that kind of backfired. So I was like, let me get rid of that and do <laughs> just take out an honors French class and get that language requirement out of the way. Okay. <laughs> take more art classes. And before graduating high school, were you working at your family's restaurant? Yeah. So when I would come home for holidays and if we were not traveling, um, I would definitely be working as a busser. And in the summers when I was here, always working. Mm -hmm. I like, scooped ice cream one summer. I worked in restaurants probably since I was 15. Mm. And coming out of high school, did you know what you wanted to do? Were you interested in going in this a similar route with your parents business? Or were you interested in something else? Um, I didn't really know. Sometimes I don't know today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I love fashion. I loved reading fashion magazines. So when I went to college, studied business management, I went to Skidmore um, College up in Saratoga and did a lot of marketing and advertising focus in the business management side. And um, after college worked for LVMH, so Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, I started there and worked um, for Christian Lacroix, which is a high-end fashion brand in France. So I worked there for a few years, did some uh, really running the showroom there, mm. uh, so mostly in sales. And then I decided that I wanted to do more marketing side. So I went to David Yerman and Ellie Tahari and then skipped over to uh, photo shoot production. Mm. Um, so that kind of like, you know, roundabout. And then in about 2008, I my dad needed some help at the restaurant. I was in between jobs. And so I started working for him, uh, bartending, and saw that he kind of needed my help more. And so I stepped in on, you know, management position. Mm. And I did that for 13 years before I came here. <laughs> and now you had you were working in the restaurant I, i'm i don't want to pronounce the name wrong it's okay de, de, de marchelier Mar de marchelier yeah perfect okay. <laughs> but did you learn how to cook there as well or any culinary um not really i learned to cook myself and just mm -hmm. watching my dad cooking at home watching the guys in the kitchen cook mm -hmm. you know it was um sort of self-taught i suppose yeah <laughs> and do you have any other experiences or or memorable experiences that when you were managing in the restaurant in the city oh gosh i don't even know where to start <laughs> working in the city you see so many people and everything happens I don't I wouldn't I don't even know where to start on that question. <laughs> Interesting things. My goodness. Oh, I'm stumped. I'm stumped because there are like so many. There's too many. There's just too many. <laughs> I mean, you know, customers are uh, customers are are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And De Marchelier, so the first one that I had mentioned was on 62nd and Lexington. Mm -hmm. Um it was there for about 13 years and there was about a year and a half before we open, or my father opened the one on 86 and Lexington, uh, I'm sorry, 86 in Madison, and really a neighborhood spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were coming there multiple times a week. I don't think people in the city really cook much in their kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we were there, you know, their canteen. Mm -hmm. And so just relationships being made, I've seen, you know, regulars have ambulance have had to come you know people out in gurneys i mean those aren't good memories but you know always wild yeah. um we uh, we were also at the end of the um the parade route mm. and every i think it was at the end of september it's the Steuben Day Parade, right? I think it's right before Oktoberfest. So Steuben Day Parade. And I remember we were working. So we were at the end of the parade. And at the end of the parade, they're all, all the Germans 
with their brass, you know, the brass bands would come in to the restaurant, everyone with their like leader hose in mm-hmm. and all their outfits. It was so great. And I probably would, I probably still have a video somewhere. Um, the whole band, they were drinking beer mostly <laughs> and they all pulled out their their instruments and and started playing it was so loud some of the some of our customers were in the back saying like unhappy because (laughs) (laughs) it was so loud but it was just it was very special that was that was a fun moment for sure and were there any challenges within just the managing of a restaurant i mean we'll get to out here but just running a restaurant in new york city and I mean, the biggest challenge in the city and out here has always been staffing, finding the right staff, finding the right people that mesh with with your business and the personalities. You know, when you have a team, you want everyone to get along. You don't want any bad apples. No. <laughs> <laughs> and how did the decision come about to relocate to Greenport? So... I've been coming to Greenport for for some time. I mean, when I was a kid, we did not come here at all, maybe to the movie theater, but it wasn't a place we were like hanging out. It was Um, a very different environment. Oh yeah, I, to say the least. And I saw the changes and started coming here to a few of the bars and the restaurants and really saw a, a positive change. So, that uh, that started planting a seed, obviously, and then um, brought my parents over to Greenport, and they were just blown away, because mm-hmm. you know we've been coming out here since since the late seventies, and what a change it was! They couldn't even believe it, really. And in the summer of two thousand nineteen, our landlord in the city decided that they were going to tear the building down, and all of the tenants had to leave, residential and commercial. Um, so it was an entire corner. There was about four or five commercial uh, tenants. And so at that point, my parents in their, my, my father at least is in his mid 70s, did not want to do another restaurant and decided to retire. So at that point, I said, well, I'll carry it on. We thought about maybe staying in the city because we had such a loyal large clientele there and obviously hard to walk away from a viable business but ultimately i think i made the right choice considering covid happened (laughs) well that was not you know part part of the plan in the city (laughs) yes a lot of restaurants at that time and When did it open up here, the restaurant? So I had found the location in October um, of 2019, um, signed a lease, and I was was going to open by the spring. But COVID happened. Uh, March 12th was the day I was going to get my building permits. And unfortunately, they uh, were not released from town or village hall and uh, didn't get them until the end of July. So... uh, a little delayed, but it is what it is. I'm here now, and uh, and the customers that I was, you know, worried about disappointing in the city. I see those faces all the time here. They take mm. day trips, whether they live in the Hamptons or even in the city, or they come for a weekend and stay at uh, local hotels. Um, yeah. So it's really nice to see all those familiar faces um, all year. Definitely. And then you mentioned with the building for just with the village, with the permit. But when you initially opened, how was the business, business-wise? Because COVID was still going on. So was it mostly all outside or takeout? Or? Well, if I recall, at that time, November 2020, we were at 50% indoors. Mostly people were sitting outside and they didn't have an issue with sitting outside. We had heaters, but it was 30 degrees and people wearing ski pants and (laughs) thrilled to be outside in that weather. Not so anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But um, we did have tables inside and it almost, you know, since I opened in November, basically the start of the low season here, I was able to grow organically. We were low on staff 
and it just almost kind of worked. Yeah. And then in terms of some of the menu options, were there any changes you made with the menu coming out here? Did you keep it pretty much similar to what you were offering? Um, I It was similar, you know, in that it's still traditional dishes, but I wanted to, in my visits to Greenport, I noticed that a lot of people, you know, like to bounce around. So I tried to gear the menu for here more on small plates and things, you know, I, I didn't want to make it so it was only small plates Mm -hmm. Um, because I knew I have like an older clientele that also likes to have an appetizer and a main course. And, but I wanted to, you know, we didn't really have like cheese plates and charcuterie in the city, but so I wanted to add things like that and small plates for that, you know, new customer that's bouncing around, like wants Mm -hmm. to try bites at all different restaurants in the village. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is one of your signature dishes? Um, well, I would say the steak tartare. People love our steak tartare. It's uh, the same recipe that we had in the city. And and also uh, we have a, this endive salad that we've had for years mm-hmm. and years and years and years. And it's got a pretty good following <laughs> as mm-hmm. well. Now, I had a question related to um, with the French cuisine and I think there's been a lot of newer restaurants that are more fusion based in some ways, but it's kind of nice to see a restaurant that has more of a traditional French cuisine instead of offering some type of fusion with other varieties where they mix things in. Is that something that was important to you to keep that traditional aspect within the French cuisine? Um, Well, yeah, because just because of also the decoration, the whole feel of the restaurant is very traditional, dark woods, Mm -hmm. warm colors. It all just goes together. Like I want people Mm -hmm. to come into the bistro and feel like they're in Paris, not a mishmash of other cultures. You come in and you, you know, a lot of people come in and they're like, wow, this is so amazing. I feel like I'm in Paris. And I say, yeah, and (laughs) you're right here in Greenport. No need to take a plane. (laughs) Yes, definitely. And now since opening to today, have you had to try to balance some things with, say, you know, obviously a lot of restaurants in the summer months, they get a lot more customers, but in terms of the winter, it's it's a struggle. So has that been something that you've been able to work out in terms of financially? I can't remember. Are you open in the... I'm open um, all year. Yeah. I have, to date, I have not closed for any extended period of time. Okay. Um, in the off season, I'm closed Mondays and Tuesdays, historically. And I still have a demand. You know, we do great lunches in the winter. Maybe it's a little slower but the weekends get busy there's less restaurants open so it's um you know it works out pretty well um yeah that's pretty it's pretty amazing that you're able to do that because i know a lot of places it's a challenge yeah i mean most of my seating is indoors and Mm -hmm. and a lot of the seasonal places most of their seating is outdoors Mm -hmm. so I do have outside seating. It's a lovely terrace. But, you know, in the winter, I have a warm, cozy atmosphere, which people are attracted to Mm -hmm. um, in all all seasons. Yes. And so with building a successful restaurant, especially even out here, requires a lot of a dedicated team. How do you nurture and empower your staff to ensure exceptional service and culinary excellence? Um, Well, that's sometimes a challenge, but I have, you know, a lot of service experience. I, I, and I try to pass that knowledge on to my team so that the service is consistent. I try my best to 
make everyone feel welcome and everyone and all of our restaurants my father's restaurants in the city it's uh, like a family atmosphere mm -hmm. like everyone takes care of each other and everyone is treated with respect and vice versa mm -hmm. and i had another question just if you have any advice for someone interested in getting into the restaurant business what advice would you give them and it could be for it doesn't have to be within the market here, just anywhere throughout the country, just if they were interested in getting started. Well, my advice before they get started would be to work in a restaurant. <laughs> a lot of people, I kind of feel like, you know, they're doing something and then they decide like, oh, I have no experience and I'll open a restaurant. You know, that's very ambitious. And, you know, not only work in a restaurant, like work in all aspects, mm -hmm. you know, be the dishwasher for a week do you know work the line for a week work behind the bar for a week like really get a full rounded experience so you know what goes into every role in in the space mm -hmm. and looking ahead for your restaurant do you have any other goals in mind for what or any other ideas that you might want to add to the restaurant sure so um, where I'm located in Greenport, it's on Main Street, but it's on the north north side of Main Street. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot less foot traffic on that side. And hopefully, you know, we're working with the businesses in that area to promote more foot traffic in that direction, um, hoping that the, the village could assist in that uh, movement of the people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. expand it up yeah. further. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of empty spaces, a lot of empty businesses along that way. And I think that deters people from from continuing their walk forward. You know, we have those four, five year round businesses there now, and hopefully there'll be more. It would be great to see that auditorium yes. turn into something great absolutely and i had two other questions what do you like about living and working on the, the east end of long island um i love being by the water i'm a, a surfer so i i love the water i mm -hmm. love being in it i being around it i live on shelter island so i have access to the ocean side mm -hmm. um, i love to sail so the bays are perfect for that mm -hmm. And just, you know, the laid back, hearing the birds in the morning and not the traffic um, <laughs> is great. <laughs> yes. And just looking to the future as a whole for the, the North Fork and the East End, what do you hope for the future of the community and the area as a whole? Um, well, I hope that there... It can be an expansion of hotels to accommodate more visitors and attract more people to live here year round and not buy homes just for Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. You know, so we just... have that. We the, the reason why I opened a business in Greenport rather than Shelter Island where I live is because there is a year round community here and on the North Fork. Um, mm -hmm. Shelter Island does have a year-round community, but the the visitors kind of stop after Labor Day, or they're mm -hmm. very limited. Um, so it makes a, a year-round business less or harder, less mm -hmm. viable, yeah. um, harder to maintain. And the North Fork does have that, but um, and with the wineries, they bring in a lot of people, but there are a lot of restaurants and a lot of wineries and i think that we can use more visitors <laughs> yes no that, that's interesting because the um well i think other people have said similar things with in regards to tourists as well as year-round residents and making sure we can keep keep the population here more year-round but i was going to ask you because you're living on Shelter Island and went to school there. Have you noticed any changes on Shelter Island? Has 
that area changed over the years? You know, people keep saying like, oh, it's changed so much, it changed so much. And I never really thought so until recently, actually. I think the the biggest change that I've seen on the island, I mean, you know, businesses can come and go, Mm -hmm. but the biggest thing for that I've seen is that the houses are getting much, much, much bigger. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. They're taking down two houses and just putting up one giant house. Mm. And that's, I think it's kind of a shame. I don't think that's. It seems unnecessary. unnecessary. (laughs) Yes. And Uh, driving out year round residents. mm -hmm. Yes. But they are also selling their homes too. So. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I think. Who do we, we blame? <laughs> I know it's happening all over. Yeah, and then I just ask at the end if there was anything else you'd like to say or discuss that we haven't talked about. Um, I don't know. I I felt welcome since I've since I opened here. Um, even when I was before the the board, presenting my business, I was really pleasantly surprised I was with my father and we couldn't believe how many people stood up and and supported my business venture here and I've always felt welcome and I've I'm so happy to be here Mm -hmm. oh definitely I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come in today and share your story and telling us about your wonderful business so it was a pleasure to have you on today thank you so much Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 63 with Emily de Marchelier. I want to thank you for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, and we'll see you next time.